Hello, my name is Martin Herold. I'm from Wageningen University and today I'm going to deliver to you the module 1.1 of the Gossi Gold World Bank FCPF training materials on the UNFCCC context and the requirements and introduction to the IPCC good practice guidelines. The UNFCCC is the United Framework Convention on Climate Change and IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on climate change that has been developing guidance to countries uh, on how to estimate and, and report uh, on land use and forest related emissions and removals. Um, there is a bunch of background materials uh, for the for this module. Um, you can find them on the slides. Uh, you can also find all of them online. I'm not going to go into them in a lot of detail uh, particular importance the UNFCCC decisions that are related um, to this lecture because what we are doing uh, or proposing to do as part of the monitoring is of course underpinned by decisions uh, modalities that have been agreed upon by the parties. In the lecture I will first give a introduction to the UNFCCC process related to reducing emission from deforestation, forest degradation and enhancement of carbon stocks, also known as RED+. Plus. We'll talk about the policy context and what are the requirements for measuring and reporting RED+, Plus activities and then we will dive into more detail into the IPCC guidelines to prepare national greenhouse gas inventories and reporting on forest land in, in particular. So, first part of the lecture, which is on the introduction to the process. Background is that for tropical forests are very important when it comes to climate. Tropical forests are a storehouse of carbon. So, trees are made of carbon and carbon is basically biomass and this carbon and this biomass uh, is important to have on the ground, to have in a terrestrial ecosystem rather than having that in the atmosphere. And if you convert forests, you burn them or they get cut and decompose, this carbon ends up to large amounts in the atmosphere and that is causing uh, emissions uh, of CO2 and is uh, further stimulating the effects on climate, climate change. So because of the large amounts of conversions of in particular tropical forests, uh, we see that in the global greenhouse gas budget that the sector, which is called AFOLU, which stands for Agriculture, Forestry and Other Land Uses, which includes the forest sector, is a significant share of the global greenhouse gas emissions budget. So there's an important contributor to um, the global emissions profile. And because it's an important uh, part of that, it's the this land use sector is the only other sector than the fossil fuel sector. So there's only two real sectors that contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, because it's an, an important share of that, um, it will be tackled and is tackled as part of any climate change mitigation policies. It's important to understand the AFOLU sector or the land use sector, or more specifically the forest sector, that it's not only an important source of greenhouse gas emission, but it's also an important sink, a source meaning that it releases carbon to the atmosphere, for example by converting or burning forest, but it can also remove uh, carbon from the atmosphere by, for example, growing as part of their uh, pr pr productivity, as part of their growth and net pr primary productivity. As trees grow, basically, they would take up more carbon and basically remove carbon uh, from the atmosphere. So it's important to understand that particular forests are both a source and the sink of carbon. And that's very important when we think about the mitigation potential. When, when we look at the distribution of above ground biomass, so that's, that's biomass stored in forests, uh, you see that a lot of the, uh, the high biomass region are in the tropical forest. These forests are very important uh, because, first of all, they grow. Uh, most of the forests actually still grow and take up carbon, so they are important and an important thing. Um, but they are basically as a storehouse of carbon. But this storehouse of carbon, this carbon, is important to be to be kept in the terrestrial biosphere and not to be released to the atmosphere. 
And I think that is a bit the basic idea behind um, efforts like Red Plus, is to make sure that this carbon that we have in the forest, in particular in the tropical forest, remains where, where it is, so it does not get converted, it does not get released to the atmosphere, and that the potential of these areas, of these forests, to take up more carbon from the atmosphere is further stimulated. So this is the basic idea behind Red Plus. We know that a lot of forest changes happening in the tropics that are both um, releasing carbon, which you see as red dots here, basically in this map, uh, in other parts it's also taking up carbon, so this is the green dot, so this is basically a net sink of carbon, in other areas it's a net source of carbon, and you see in large parts of the tropics it's actually a net source uh, of carbon or, or of CO2, 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 and again this is the idea that this net source of carbon is turned into, is re reduced and eventually turned into a sink. The idea was actually uh, put out, put forward as part of the UN Climate Convention mitigation framework. The idea surfaced in 2005 and after a couple of negotiations this mechanism of Red Plus was, was agreed. Um, it includes five activities reducing emissions from deforestation, reducing emissions from forest degradation, that's what's known as RED, conserving of forest carbon stocks, the sustainable management of forests, and the enhancement of forest carbon stocks, which is commonly referred to as the plus part, because it, it enhances the sink. Um, uh, that's what it's called. When we talk about RED plus, this is what we talk about, is about these five activities. Um, the RED plus is particularly focused on tropical uh, regions on tropical countries uh, and that is because in the previous climate agreement, the Kyoto climate agreement, um, developing countries did not have any targets or any incentives to do these red plus activities but now as part of the Paris agreement these activities are now part of a climate agreement and so um, this tropical forest and the efforts to reduce the source and enhance the sink of carbon is now part of that climate change agreement. There's a whole history uh, on when these, uh, on how that was negotiated, uh, started in 2005 when it was put on the table by uh, two countries and um, basically um, then was further developed over a series of negotiations um, that not only included the policy framework, but also uh, some of the methodological guidance uh, and some of the modalities for measuring, reporting, verification, for reference, emission levels, for safeguards and drivers. So all of these different things have been negotiated over the course of these years. And basically this is the foundation uh, that if we talk about RED Plus and we talk about RED Plus mon monitoring, uh, that we have gu guidance and information on how to move forward on that. With that, I would like to move on to the second part uh, of the lecture, which is uh, really talking about these requirements that have been set by the policy framework. Um, so the big important step was the Paris Agreement, which is an, a new legally binding framework of internationally coordinated efforts to tackle climate change. It basically replaces the Kyoto Protocol. protocol. It has this ambition to, <clears throat> to hold, to not move beyond two degrees, in fact try to stay well below two degrees of warming compared to global warming, uh, compared to pre-industrial levels. And Red Plus is a part of the Paris Agreement, there's a particular paragraph, uh, it's Article 5, that really um, puts, that, puts that idea forward. Um, from a policy side, any mitigation measures that are supposed to be formulated and uh, implemented and also reported by countries are related to what's called National Determined Contributions or NDCs. They are supposed to be communicated and updated every five years. Um, any Red Plus action and support needs to be included uh, in the NDC. And a global stock take happens every five years where basically the collective mitigation actions ex ex expressed by these nationally determined contributions will be assessed in terms of how they meet uh, the global goal uh, of staying well below 
two, de two, de two, de two, de two degrees. What is also very important as part of Paris is what's called enhancing transparency frameworks so that we have the situation that countries propose activities, mitigation activities as part of their NDCs um, and they have to basically provide all the information so that they can actually be properly assessed. Um, but to do that uh, it, everything needs to be open, transparent and follow certain guidelines and um, um, because the, this NDC process is very much bottom-up uh, but it also has to make sure that everything adds up uh, globally towards the two, de two degree and so transparency is very important to achieve that. Um, the information that countries report is usually detailed in their what's called the National Inventory Report and uh, there is a specific module Module 3.3 as part of this series, uh, if you want to learn more details about, about that. The technical assessment or the technical expert review that will be happening is organized by the UN Climate Convention. Um, so let's dive a bit more into the WETPRAS mechanism. So parties should collectively aim to slow, hold, reverse forest cover and, gar and, and carbon loss. The loss of forest cover and carbon, and so and this should be done by doing implementing these three, uh, sorry these five red plus activity. Participation is voluntary, uh, and it's uh, it has to be in line with country capacities and circumstances. So the speed and the type of activities will will vary uh, by country countries. Um, there is this idea of performance-based payments that basically if a country is able to uh, show performance on reducing forest emissions or enhancing the forest things through the five red plus ag activ activities it will be able to be compensated for that. Um, to actually do the assessment of performance you have to report in greenhouse gas units what the performance actually is and this is uh, basically the difference between what would happen without red plus in terms of forest emissions and removals and then what is being achieved with red plus in terms of forest emissions and removals and the difference is basically related to the perf performance. To do that you actually have to have methodologies to estimate the actual emissions and, re and removals um, to do that to establish a reference level. The reference level is the benchmark against which and any payments will be, uh, any performance will be compared to um, and to also assess the performance for the accounting period with the same coverage of emissions and remo rem rem removals. And so since Red Plus is results-based, supposed to be results-based actions, everything done should be measured, reported and verified. That's what's commonly known as MRV, measuring, reporting and verification. and to provide the data and information um, uh, for MRV, um, it requires a national forest monitoring system. There are some guidance from the negotiation on the MRV of Red Plus activities. Um, developing countries are requested to include the following elements, a national strategy or action plan, uh, which should also include information on the drivers of deforestation and forest degradation. There's a whole module on drivers that is also provided as part of this series. To develop robust and transparent national forest monitoring systems and, if appropriate, subnational systems. To provide a national forest reference emission level or forest reference level. There's also a whole module on that. Um, and a system providing information on the safeguards. If you go into a bit more detail. Um, this whole Red Plus process is addressed as a phased approach um, so that countries basically work their way into um, preparing, demonstrating and eventually implementing uh, Red Plus. Uh, so in terms of phase one is usually readiness where um, you develop a national strategy or action plan and you start with in terms of the MRV activities with basic capacity development, assess your gaps and needs, develop a roadmap on, on, on how to how to close these gaps and, and build the capacities required. 
in the phase two you're really investing in demonstration um, so you basically um, showcase in some maybe regional local circumstance on how red plus can work in practice and how we can actually also monitor be monitored in practice along a capacity development pathway on the national level. Phase three is full Im implementation, where basically this idea of doing red, red, red plus activities, assessing their performance, and also estimating and reporting the performance uh, for actual payments is being done in an operational way. The backbone for MRV is a national force monitoring system. Uh, the modalities of that have also been de been, de been defined um, and it should include uh, certain considerations. Guidance is you should build on existing systems as much as possible. Existing system, for example, is ongoing uh, uh, national and local monitoring efforts in the countries, appropriate inst institutions and so, and so on. It should enable the assessment of different types of forest in your country, including natural forest, as compared to, for example, planted forests. Um, it should be flexible and allow for imp improvement, building these national forest monitoring systems, and also building your national greenhouse gas inventories uh, is a con continuous process of improvement. You start at a certain point, you build capacities, perhaps in certain areas of particular priori priority, but you evolve the system over, over time and that is basically also the idea of the phased approach that you start, you build, you demonstrate and eventually you move to a, a full operational mode. Um, module 1.2 as part of the series will give you more detail on, on how to build a national forest monitoring system. But just to give a bit of a glimpse, um, the national forest monitoring system is encomp encompasses the MRV uh, the MRV function, so to say, which is measuring, reporting and verification, where you have a satellite monitoring system to particular to assess uh, forest and forest area changes. You have a national forest inventory, which usually is the key data source uh, on providing uh, information about uh, biomass, carbon stocks and emission factors. And you have a greenhouse gas inter inventory where you take the information provided by these uh, by the satellite land monitoring system and by the National Forest Industry into your greenhouse gas inventory for the forest sector, but also to integrate that in your full uh, National Greenhouse Gas Inventory, which also includes a whole bunch of other sectors. You have also a monitoring function, which is more related to, um, well, policy objectives. Uh, so you would, how would you implement your Red Plus monitoring in your country, provide information on where and how deforestation is happening, enhance transparency, involve stakeholders, for example, through community moni monitoring, um, produce other monitoring, uh, forest monitoring tasks that might not be related directly to MRV, bar, but are an important part of your national uh, forest resource management and forest ma uh, and or particular forest management strategies. One important part for Red Plus, for implementing Red Plus, is to assess the drivers um, of deforestation. Um, because if you, from a policy perspective, want to do something to reduce deforestation, you have to understand what causes it in the first place. Um, this can be many different. There can be many different ways uh, of what can drive deforestation, and it's important to invest to understand them before you. But for example, set your priorities on how to tackle certain drivers um, through policies, through local um, interventions, and so on. Um, the other part that is important is safeguards. Safeguards can be understood as, um, yeah, as risk reduction tools. So if you consider these safeguards, um, which, for example, is to consider biodiversity, to involve indigenous people, to link your Red Plus. Uh, objectives with your country's development ob ob objectives um, and so on. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, if you consider those you and you in integrate them, you reduce your risk of your Red Plus not working. Uh, so that's, I think, the, an important part that also links a bit to these monitoring activities we are talking about here. Another important part is these forest reference mission level or forest reference levels. 
um, they are basically benchmark for assessing the country's performance in implementing Red, Red Plus. They're supposed to be in greenhouse gas units and they should be consistent with your national greenhouse gas inven, inven, inventory. Um, you have to take into account historical data because the reference level basically provides your greenhouse gas or your forest related greenhouse gas assessment of the country before Red Plus or what would happen in your forest emissions and removals without Red Plus. Um, um, so you have to basically look in, in, in the past and what has happened to the forest, think about what might happen in the, in the future if Red Plus would not be impl impl implemented. Um, this process of developing reference levels uh, and submitting them to the UN uh, FCCC is ongoing uh, and um, quite a few number of Red Plus countries have already submitted, submitted them. In terms of the modalities for MRV, for measuring reporting and verifying, um, again they should be in a similar uh, unit, so it's, it's basically greenhouse gas units, so it's tons of CO2 per year, uh, and of course these numbers, these estimations should be consistent with what you provided in the reference level, huh? because at the end you want to compare what you measured and reported with Red Plus to what the reference level says, which is without Red Plus. And that difference is basically related to the compensation that a country could could it could achieve. Data and methodologies might be improved over time, uh, while consistency with the reference level has to be main, maintained. Um, it has been agreed that there should be biannual update rep reports uh, by by parties, country, countries, um, and that should include a very various number of uh, um, uh, of inf inf information. Um, and for more information on reporting Red Plus performance, there's a whole module. It's module 3.3, where you can find more out more about that. With that, I would like to move on to the third part of the lecture. Um, which is related to the IPCC good practice guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories and for reporting on forest land. Um, the IPCC good practice guidelines is the key guidelines that countries have agreed upon to develop uh, their national greenhouse gas inventories. So in the UNFCC Red Plus context, developing countries or Red Plus countries should then identify their land use and forestry activities related to, to, to drivers and use a combination of remote sensing and ground-based carbon inventory for estimating anthropogenic forest-related greenhouse gas emissions and removals, forest carbon stocks and forest area changes. The most, uh, most agreed um, IPCC good practice guidance um, is in 2003 this one uh, is what's called LULUCF, Land Use, Land Use Change in Forestry. And there is a more recent one, which is called the AFOLU, um, which is 2006 uh, guidelines, which is an agri uh, agriculture, forest, and other land uses. Uh, so both are Im Im important. Um, they basically give you, as a country, the, the rules, the proposed methodologies, and principles on how you should report uh, your country's land use and forest related emissions and removals. Since these tools, the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines 2003 and 2006 have been basically agreed before Red Plus was really out there, there is further guidance given on how to use these guidelines for the purpose of Red Plus and this is provided in the GFOI methods and guidance document that is also given to you uh, as part of the as part of the background materials to that lecture. One important fundamental part of the IPCC good practice is there are reporting principles. Um, there are five of them. Um, the first one is consistency, which basically means in your inventory you have to use the same definitions and methodologies over time, so you compare your estimations over time. Your estimate should be comparable. You should use standard methodologies and formatted providing 
by the IPCC and agreed within the UNFCCC that also estimates can be compared across countries. It's very important to be transparent so the assumptions and methodologies are clearly explained and appropriately documented so any te technical assessment of your greenhouse gas inventory or your um, uh, reference level so to say uh, can be assessed by independent experts. Accuracy, the estimates should be neither over nor underestimated, um, so it should be unbiased as much as possible and uncertainties should be reduced as far as practicable. Um, it should also be complete, um, it should include all the agreed categories, greenhouse gases and, green, uh, and carbon pools for all relevant geographic areas. Um, One important part of, of course, the forest definition. So that's an that's an basically an accounting rule that's supposed to be established as part of the um, your national greenhouse gas in, in vent, inventory. Countries may use their own definitions, but they should uh, be used consistently. Uh, so you cannot change your forest definition over time. If you change your forest definition, you have to recalculate all your historical emissions, and that's quite some work. Um, to use, um, so there is the suggestion to use the FAO definition of forest, which uh, uses certain criteria. Um, but as said, countries can also deviate from that. What is usually the critical questions are um, thresholds for the minimum forest area, the minimum amount of ground cover, and the minimum amount of tree height. So countries might have 10%, some countries have 20, 30 or other percent. Um, to what extent plantations are included as forests, and that can be plantations of uh, forestry, forestry plantations, but also, for example, on how food crops um, such as oil palm uh, or others, whether they are part of forests or not. Uh, and of course, the important of the natural forest class and there is a recommendation to make sure you can assess also the changes in natural forests um, as part of your national forest monitoring systems and so those are usually the critical decisions a country would have to make um, but the general recommendation is try to use the FAO definition um, if you don't have a good reason to not do, do so. So now after the reporting princi principles of the IPCC good practice guidelines Let's talk a bit about the estimation of carbon emissions or the basic ideas. And here's a very, looks very complicated, but it's actually quite an easy equation to explain. So you have two main factors, which is the area of forest loss, what's called here A loss. And you have the C loss, where the, if you estimate the emissions from deforestation, you have the area in hectares um, of what of what is deforested. Let's say it can be a thousand hectares, can be ten thousand hectares. This area estimation is what's called activity data because that's the activity, it's the forest conversion. And this is multiplied with the sea loss, which is just the change of carbon stocks per unit area. So that's in tons per hectare uh, in terms of carbon once you have a clearing of forest. And that's what's called the emission factor. So if you multiply the area of deforestation, which could be, let's say, a thousand hectares, um, and you multiply that with the amount of carbon that is lost per hectare on average uh, for that period, it would be called emission factors. Let's say you use a hundred tons, um, you would multiply a thousand um, hectares times a hundred tons per hectare, and that will give you a hundred thousand tons of carbon emissions based on deforestation, what's called gross carbon emissions. Um, so in that sense, the estimation that you want to do is really try to get estimations on the forest area change, in this case the loss, it can also be the gain of forest, so increase of forest area, and the carbon loss uh, per, um, per area converted. And the activity data, this is the information that's commonly being derived from satellite data, uh, the emission factors, 
uh, those are often derived from ground measurements um, or from basically from forest invent inventories. And you can sum that up over all different types of forest um, that you have because your emission factors, for example, might vary for different forest types or will likely vary for different forest types. And so this basic idea of emission factors uh, and activity data this is basically throughout the IPCC Good Practice Guidance. You will find that a lot. Um, so even for um, other sectors, uh, you will also find emission, fa emission factors and activity data to be estimated. And how to estimate activity data and emission factors for forest, this is what's basically uh, guiding the whole set of modules, the technical modules um, that are also part of the series. So for example, there is a whole series of lectures on how to actually get activity data both for deforestation and for forest degradation. These are modules 2.1 and 2.2 and how you estimate emission factors or carbon stock changes. This is module 2.3. Um, of course forest stratification is an important part and there is more guidance given uh, as part of the GFOI methods and guidance document. Uh, so let's dive into a bit more into activity data. Um, as part of the IPC, activity data can be assessed with three different approaches. Um, approach one is where you have net changes in forest area, forest being one of the land use categories. Um, this is, for example, the information that is commonly provided by the FRA, the FAO FRA. So you have basically in forest area estimate for a certain, for various moments in, 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 in time. Um, that um, that does not um, allow you to assess deforestation and reforestation because it's only a net area change. This is approach one. Approach two, you can actually track conversions between different land use cate categories on a non-spatially explicit basis. Um, so that includes changes between categories. You can assess, for example, uh, changes from forest to agricultural land, changes from forest to grassland, but also reforestation. So if it's as a grassland, for example, is uh, converted back into a forest. This is basically you have a change matrix for your country area, for example. That's what's called approach three, uh, approach two. Approach three, you can track land use conversion on a spatially explicit basis. There you can assess changes between and within categories. This kind of approach is usually uh, uh, supported by remote sensing data and satellite approaches and is what is also often recommended and done as part of the, the National Greenhouse Gas uh, inventories for Red, red Plus con countries. Um, for emission factors it's very important to um, about that uh, to get good data on emission factors you have to basically measure forest biomass and forest carbon. Um, is basically defined as the above and below ground live plant material. Um, about roughly speaking, a half of biomass of of dry matter biomass is carbon. So the, what's called a carbon fraction is about 47%. So if you have an estimate of biomass, you say 100 tons. If a carbon fraction of 0.47, you have 47 tons of carbon. To get biomass estimates, it can be done in a um, in different ways. You can have destructive direct measurements of biomass. That would mean you will cut a tree, dry it and weigh it. That is not something that is very practical. Um, so it's often done through non-destructive methods, for example, measuring dBH and height and using allometric equations and conversion factors to get from these field measurements to carbon stocks. Um, they can be inferred from remote sensing. There are some problems there and you often need ground data to calibrate that. But it can also be models that can be that can help in that context, and you can see more of that in module 2.3. Um, the emission factors can be estimated uh, uh, for different carbon pools. We just talked about biomass. There's an, uh, the buff ground biomass, which is basically the buff ground trees and shrubs and leaves, um, live tree. Below ground biomass is the roots. Uh, there's dead wood, which are logs and fallen branches. There's litter, which is fine woody debris and leaves and hummus that's on the above the soil. And you have, of course, the soil organic matter or the soil organic carbon that is incorporated into mineral soils. 
in theory all five pools should be re re reported but often they are reported on different levels of accuracy um, or different levels of sof sof sophist sophistication that's in this difference level of sophistication is are provided by the different tiers um, so if people talk about uh, tier 1, tier 2, tier 3 for emission factor estimation um, this is related to well, often to the quality of the, of the data so tier 1 uh, tier 1 would be used in a situation where a country does not have any data uh, and the IPCC would provide default factors in terms of biomass, average biomass for different uh, forest regions in terms of carbon fraction and also other estimations to two, you, here you would actually have country-specific data, for example, from field inventories, permanent plots, or measurements that you've done in the country. Um, and that's different than tier two, because tier two, you would just take default values. Tier two would be based on country data. And tier three is a very detailed inventory where you have repeated measurements of carbon stock changes over time, where you combine, you try to trace all of these carbon pools, and you really try to track these changes over time and that might in, in involve some some modeling um, it can be that these different tiers are intermixed so you might uh, have um, a national forest inventory where you measure things which would be tier two um, and uh, you might have allometric equations that you've measured in your country but the carbon fraction for example you don't have a lot of information so you use the default which would be tier, tier one um, and since you might not have a lot of information on dead wood or even soil carbon, you might just report that on tier one level. Uh, so oftentimes in practice, um, there can be various tiers used, uh, but the ambition should be for countries to go at least to tier two, uh, to use actually, actually nationally measured data, and in some instances to move to, to, move to tier three. Um, there are two methods to, to estimate carbon emissions. Um, basically, is the measured what's called gain loss and methods called stock change. Um, stock change would mean you will measure carbon at point one, you measure carbon at point two and the difference uh, is the difference in the, in the stocks. Um, you, this requires you have to have two measurements, so for example two national invent, full national inventories. Um, gain loss, um, which is generally more applicable and perhaps most suitable for um, for Red Plus purposes or for many of the Red Plus purposes you have a carbon stock and you only estimate what is being gained so for example for a mean in your increment of forests or um, uh, some kind of uh, growth uh, and what has been lost for example what are the losses by degradation uh, or other type of, of disturbances so you do have the measurement of stock ones and you only look at the gains and losses uh, um, this is just to give a first introduction to that there's a whole module uh, that will describe you that in, in more detail. And then of course you have these various pools, uh, these carbon pools, uh, above ground biomass, below ground biomass, and you can, there's a guidance on how these fluxes, uh, the, the movement of carbon in the system can actually happen. So, you know, growth, the blue arrows, um, so taken up CO2 from the atmosphere, goes to the above ground biomass pool, can also go to the below ground biomass pool. It can be transferred, for example, to deadwood litter and other parts. It can also be released um, to the atmosphere, for example, through, bio, uh, through fires or through uh, decomposition. Um, and so you see a bit how carbon can move in, this, in the system. Um, what you see on this graph, there's also a, a sixth carbon pool, uh, which is provided here, which is called harvested wood products. So besides these, let's say, natural pools, you can also store um, carbon in products, for example, construction materials, and then you can account for that in a as a separate in a separate carbon pool. Not all conversions, of course, are possible between the pools, and there is guidance how to do that. So, for example, um, certain um, so emissions from deforestation and forest degradation uh, can only happen from from for these kind of conversions, and so there are a lot of changes when it comes to deforestation. Um, uh, and degradation cannot actually happen in practice, so that should already help you to, um, yeah, to really target your um, reporting to these key changes that can actually happen. So this is just also this is the kind of information that's why this table is shown here that you can get 
from the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines. So it provides you really practical advice on how, what you can do, what you should not do. Uh, and uh, it's not only the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines, but there's also the GFOI Methods and Guidance document. There's also the Govsi Gold Source Book. These should also help you to make more sense um, and prepare your uh, inventory and collect the data uh, to under, under, underpin that reporting. With that, I would like to come to the summary of this session. Um, so the Red Plus is a is part of the UN Climate Convention process. Uh, it is uh, documented in decisions made by the conference of the of the, of the parties over a course of just years, including most recently the Paris Agreement. As part of that, countries are encouraged to do Red Plus to measure and report. The results on these five act activities using the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines and the given the information given there, including activity data, emission factors for the various pools, um, and um, so all the so all the guidance is there to do that. Um, that for Red Plus, uh, it requires to establish national forest monitoring systems, uh, where a key component of that is a system. Uh, or process for measuring reporting uh, and also the verification the verification uh, often being done as part of the technical assessment uh, of the UN Climate Convention and on top of these IPC good practice guidelines which will be used and the technical assessment will compare uh, what the country is doing and how much they meet the requirements set out by the IPC good practice guidelines there's more information also provided by the um, uh, uh, the Global Forest Observation Init Initiative Methods and Guidance docu documents. If you'd like to learn a bit more about this, uh, if you look at the modules, so all of the module you can download the PDF on the website uh, provided. You can also have look at some of the country examples. Um, there was a review done of um, the Forest Carbon Partnership, the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership, Red Plus Countries Readiness Preparation Proposals. That could be interesting in particular if you like to start up some something. There's an example on uh, from Mexico on how Mexico is relatively advanced in their national greenhouse gas inventories, including forests, and they have how they have used the phased approach over the recent years to improve it and, and what decisions they have made. And there are also some experiences from Annex 1 countries, Annex 1 countries being developed countries that have been using these IPCC good practice guidelines for many years and how to use go to tier 3 approaches and use some models for carbon account, counting. There's no sp specific exercise, but um, what is recommended that once you have uh, done this lecture, module 1.1, on the generic introduction, that you particularly could follow up with module 1.2 uh, which is go, which will provide you more information to go in detail on building national forest monitoring systems for Red Plus, and then all these technical modules, 2.1 to 2.8. This really gives you the technical background how to do Red Plus measuring and reporting, and the module 3.1 to 3.3 on how you do the Red Plus assessment and re uh, and reporting and and performance assessment. With that, I would like to just skim through a bunch of references um, that you can uh, look into that if you like to get more information and um, like to say farewell and I wish you successful further um, uh, yeah educational experience with these training modules. <laughs>